Welcome to Ali Fitness Podcast, a weekly production all about bringing health into fitness. With an eye toward the future, but steeped in wisdom from 38 years of practicing yoga, Stephanie Spence is a yoga educator, author, inspirational speaker, activist, entrepreneur, and creative leader. Based in California, she is a trailblazer with an inspiring and empowering approach to self-inquiry and personal development. Stephanie is the former CEO of Spence Communications, which published PA's Health and Fitness magazine and has been featured on TV and several books and magazines around the world. Stephanie is also one of the original creators of Active.com, which we'll talk about a bit. She is committed to helping ignite the desire of others to create a life of health and joy for themselves through a sustainable practice of yoga for a lifetime of transformation. Stephanie, welcome to the show. Allie, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Just your mission of that transformation, the sustainable practice of yoga for a lifetime of transformation is inspiring in itself. But um, I'd love to start just by finding out how did you come across this amazing practice of yoga? That's a great question. Um, pain has been actually one of my greatest teachers over my lifetime. And I um, was a you know very active super high energy person and was doing a lot of different things from uh, competition, water skiing, running, um, whatever I could do that was movement. And as a result, and as a very young person, I realized pretty quickly after years and years of beating myself up that I, I had a problem with my back. Now, my parents didn't seem to figure this out, sadly enough, but I actually have a a pretty twisted spine. So somewhere along the way, I'm only 19 years old and all these doctors want to give me these horrible drugs, Darvon, Valium, all these things. And luckily for me, a friend of mine who actually changed my life was the um, athletic trainer for Evander Holyfield, who at the time was the heavyweight champion of the world. And this man said to me, Steph, you know, what's your plan? You you can't be on these drugs forever. Well, I didn't know. I was 19, and I assumed if a doctor had given it to me. Now, granted, this is almost 40 years ago. So he said, you got to get a new plan. And he said, well, why don't you try yoga? So I, I go to my first yoga class, and immediately my back feels better. And immediately I, I get off the drugs. I start using integrative therapies like a chiropractor and or a you know a Chinese medicine doctor and it just totally catapulted me onto a life of wellness. All the really cool yummy yoga gifts came after years. All I knew was it was really easy to stay motivated. I go to yoga, I feel great. I don't go to yoga, my back hurts. But it was also pretty clear very quickly, I was sleeping better. I could concentrate. Um, My energy level was not as um, kinetic or scattered or like I like to call now multitask oriented, but it just did everything. It was just, it was this immediate, immediate results driven tool that worked for me. That's awesome. And, and I, I must admit, it's a common theme that I hear when, when I ask people about yoga. But let's just start with, well, w- what is yoga? Is it fitness? Is it health? Both? More? What is it? I would say, I would go with more if those are my, my selections. It is a physical, emotional, and spiritual. It's a, a body, mind, and spirit practice. And I like to use the word practice because you're right. A lot of people come because, you know, either they've had a, an injury or, you know, it's to meet, you know, cute chicks or um, because they, you know, it's the new buzz and they want to try or go with a friend. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter why you get there because yoga is not a religion, but it is a spiritual practice. And everybody comes with uh, some of the same idea. And no one leaves with the same idea. And that's the the power, I think, of it being something that is 
easy to do for your whole life because anybody can do it and it meets you where you're at when you show up. Mm. Interesting you say that anybody can do it. Tell us more about that. Well, I've seen everything from um, wounded warriors who come back with uh, new uh, new limbs to, um, you know, 90-year-old people in a chair. It is something that is, you know, has no designs on what gender, age, weight, nationality. It's, it's pretty, you know, uh, welcoming to anyone that shows up. My life partner, Michael, is a runner. He and I used to do, God, at least six half marathons a year kind of runner. And it, people always say to me, oh, you know, Michael must do yoga with you. And I'm like, mm, no, but he's actually started coming recently. And, and it's so nice for me to see somebody go, holy cow, you, you know, Steph, I, I've heard you talk, I, you know. I know you drank the Kool-Aid, but it kind of wasn't for me. And it's it's amazing to me how it helps with your recovery time or it just makes you sleep better or, you you know, whatever you're going for and whatever you think you're going to get. I can guarantee you you're going to get a lot of more, you're a lot more than you expected. And wow, what else does that? Mm. Interesting too. There's there's a lot of different varieties of yoga. So I feel like someone can go to a yoga class and have a very different experience to a different type of yoga class. Can you're you so, can you're you so yeah? Can you tell us the differences? Of, I guess the different styles of yoga, and then also, I don't know, like where that where where someone should start. Maybe that's a great question. And and what's great and challenging about that is if you don't go to a class that first resonates with you, it could be a lot of different things. And like dating, you have to expend some energy to find one that works for you. So for instance, my practice and my favorite practice for me is Ashtanga, very physical, very demanding, very, um, uh, um, if you go to a, a traditional Ashtanga teacher, it is a very uh, repetitive, organized, um, almost dogmatic kind of powerful flow. Now, there's everything from that all the way to yin, which is a more meditative, relaxing, restorative type of practice. So between the many, many different lineages in the West, we have pretty much uh, taken a lot of the eight limbs of yoga, which are, we could talk about later on if you want, but I would suggest we stick with just one of the limbs, which is asana, and that is the physical part. You have to try a couple of different ones to see what works for you. So for instance, you know, uh, back in the day, you had to go to a designated stu studio, but now between the number of people that have been certified and certifications are imp important. I'm a huge person that, that believes in that, but you can even get really good yoga now at a gym. And before, you know, as a purist starting almost 40 years ago, I used to really believe in that hour and a half long clash with no mirrors and no music. And now I'm more of the middle path. I don't, I don't think silly things like goat yoga or yoga. I don't think beer yoga is yoga, but I certainly think if you go to a class that has headphones and you're moving and you're connecting your breath to your movements, if you're in your body, if you're experiencing life on your mat and you somehow get a new awareness of how that translates into your day, you're doing yoga, no matter what style it is. So yes, there's many styles. There's variations of styles. There's different people like, ah, for instance, like Anna Forrest, she has forest yoga. There's a lot of people that claim to be the creators of power yoga. And I don't know which one really did, but if you like something physical, you always look for something that is more um, either hatha or, uh, you know, a, a flow or 
you know, a, a strength class. But I suggest to everybody to first just go to a beginner class. And the key, and and I really stress this, and, and I have a lot about this in my book, is to tell, I mean, to take the minute to get to know the teacher and just say, this is what I'm looking for, which does a huge amount of things. It helps them watch you. It helps them identify if you have any injuries or, you know, why you're there. And you'd be shocked and amazed and surprised. You wouldn't, Allie, but a lot of people would to find out that this person is so motivated to, you know, help you accomplish your goals. That one thing alone, and a lot of people don't do, is if you introduce yourself to the yoga teacher, no matter what style it is, they may even tell you, hey, I don't really know if this is the perfect class for you, but let me hook you up with that one. Do you agree with that? Yeah, definitely, because I think a lot of yoga teachers like yourself just want people to experience yoga. And yoga to to one person, I guess, is is different for, for another, but you mentioned a few things when you were describing yoga that I'm intrigued about. You mentioned breath and you mentioned being in your body. Are they the two components that you would need to call it yoga? For me, yes. Uh, the, 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 the mindful practice of even stopping you know, placing your hand over your heart, closing your eyes and taking a breath. Most people are reacting to life and just, you know, these this events and things and, you know, stuff is just hurled at you all day long. And if you could even just stop and take that moment, put your hand on your heart, close your eyes. And even if that bugs you, say to yourself, I'm breathing in. I'm breathing out. Now you're in your body and you're already doing yoga. Mm. Interesting. I'm also intrigued about your experience with yoga because you mentioned that you did Ashtanga yoga primarily. I mean, it sounds like you, you've done lots of different types of yoga, but you're drawn towards Ashtanga, which for for the listeners, um, I, th- I believe was designed for initially for 14-year-old teenage boys to, to sort of get their energy out. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. In fact, um, the there's a lot of new literature out there that supports the idea that because people could not do meditation, they did these poses to kind of get the vrittis out back in India. And the guy lived down the street from a gymnastics studio and a bodybuilding studio. And so the poses actually have not even been around for a hundred years. So here this 5,000 year old system of living in the last hundred years, we've been doing the asanas really with a way to get to Shavasana. So to me, the whole purpose of doing the physical part is to get to that space at the end where I think all the magic happens. Savasana really is the place where everything that you've done in the physical, I mean, you know, runners know this, you go out, you know, you get that endorphins, you get the runner's high, whatever you want to call it. But more than that, you get that meditative one foot in front of the other. And all of a sudden your brain goes from alpha to beta, you know, you figure out, wow, okay, life is really good or, Ooh, this is an awful run, you know, but I, but you come back because there's something in that magic of connecting movement to a physical uh, structure or organized system. But what I, what has always um, not only kept me coming back, but has just been this onion that I've peeled for my whole lifetime. Now the health, Benefits are awesome. I mean, it's we could go on and on. If somebody doesn't know now, it reduces stress and, you know, helps with depression. And there are scientific studies now that show the benefits. And sadly, we had to, you know, uh, get some kind of proof to believe 
that why are people still doing this? It's, I think, more for the emotional benefits, the mental benefits, and the, the spiritual side. Yeah. And so you've mentioned a couple of words there too, like asana, which for, for argument's sake means, say, movement or, or, or poses. And then you also mentioned shavasana. And right. we, we, we won't go into that description yet because what I'd like you to do is actually tell us about the eight limbs of yoga that you were referring to because I think it's important that – um, we all get an understanding of that because a lot of people in the West see yoga as being the asanas, the, the, the practice, the physical practice. But in actual fact, why was, why, why were the asanas even designed? What, what was the purpose of those and where do they fit into the eight limbs? Well, the eight limbs of yoga are basically the system of living and I don't know how other people feel about this, but you could argue that there's dogmatic systems of of uh, uh, global religions that have things like the Ten Commandments, or you know, groups like AA have the you know the the twelve steps. So the eight limbs are pretty simple, and I can quickly go over them. Yama is the first limb, and basically it's just like uh, moral, moral vows or a discipline. Niyama is like an observation. Asana is the posture. Sorry, Stephanie, can I just stop you there? Can you give me an example of yama and niyama? Yeah, like y- yama would be something that is inwardly reflected, meaning like um, – uh, how do I feel about myself? How do I want to show up for myself in the world? And then niyama is the outward expression of that. So it's like a positive duty. And again, to me, it's something as simple as a rule of conduct of living. So for instance, non-harm. So if yama is me saying, um, uh, you know, this morning, my intention is to um, s- start my day with uh, something positive. Like I don't pick up my phone for the first hour. That's a yama. It's just a, a discipline. Some people journal, some people meditate. Other people could get very serious about these things, but this is just my personal practice. Same with niyama. You know, how do I want to express uh, this observance? Meaning, when I decide to, you know, come to your donation based yoga class, that is a form of niyama, that is a form of how I want to show up in the world by my behaviors. Does that make sense? Mm, great. Thank you. And then asana, you said, was the third limb, and, and that's obviously the poses. Oh. And then what comes after that? Pranayama, which are the breathing techniques. There are many. Uh, pratyahara is sense withdrawal. It could be something as simple as um, getting quiet, uh, looking at a candle. Um, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be um, something rigid, but it could just be a matter of getting quiet. So it's a sense withdrawal. And then dharana is focused concentration. This could be something as simple as when I do ashtanga, traditionally, you breathe in five times and breathe out five times, or I'm sorry, five counts in each pose before you move to the next pose. So that could be a focused concentration. So there's there's a lot of ways to do all of these, and it really depends on what your teacher suggests or how much research you do on your own, because sadly, so many people aren't being taught the eight limbs. So let's move on to the next one. That's Dhyana, and that's just like a meditative absorption. To me, what that means is that tricky question that everybody always says, how do I take what I'm learning on my yoga mat out into my day? 
Well, the only way you could really do that is with observance, which to me is really the the big jewel in yoga, which is self-awareness. So for instance, if I you know, get to a yoga studio and it makes me angry when somebody has taken my favorite spot that I always lay my mat. The only way I could really take what I've learned right now into my day is to go, huh, are other things like that making me angry? And why? And so many people, it's shocking. And that's why I love that they're teaching yoga in schools now, have never even been taught how to do this. I know as a child with my family of origin, I wasn't taught to check in with myself. And this one limb, I think is just amazing because it takes everything that I've done through all of my practice, which you can get, you know, everything with one practice. And it makes me accountable to myself to go, huh, what am I getting from this? And how am I designing my life with the information that I'm getting? And then the last limb is samadhi, which is really just bliss or enlightenment. And some people will say, whoo, enlightenment. And that's, you know, that's pretty intense. Doesn't only like, you know, isn't only the Dalai Lama enlightened or somebody like that. And personally, I think anyone who is interested in, in pursuing um, a life of, of unlimited potential is enlightened. There's a higher consciousness awareness because of this practice that you're doing that comes over time. And it comes with the idea that you're going to take these tools and try and apply them to your day. Mm. Mm. That's a really good description. I like how you gave those examples. So I guess you talk a lot, especially in your book too, about yoga off the mat. Can you tell us, I mean, maybe even give us give us a bit of background about your new book and, and why you wrote it and how you experience yoga on and off the mat throughout this journey? Yeah, thank you so much because this this labor of love, the book is, is uh, has is 10 years in the making. And it was inspired by a 4,000 mile yoga road trip where I rediscovered and reignited my life by interviewing a different yoga teacher every day. I'd practice with the yoga teacher. I'd get back in my RV and I'd go on to the next day. And it was so life transforming that I pretty quickly knew, wow, how can I, if this is happening for me, how can I share this with other people? So I pretty quickly figured out I needed to do a book. But the wild thing for me at the time was I originally saw the book as being a daily words of wisdom from a different teacher. So I actually spent 10 years going to 40 countries and interviewing almost 400 teachers. What eventually um, was in the book is 115 teachers because it simply was something too big. So I have I have plans on what to do with all the other wisdom, but the the common thread that also pretty quickly emerged was everyone comes to yoga for one reason, gets a lot more. Everyone in the book has moved through life's inevitable ups and downs by using this amazing tool to move through those things with with grace. And as somebody who had totally checked out of their life, you'll you'll see in the book, my journey begins at the worst time in my life. And this tool of transformation that I had already been using, I had been doing yoga. But I hadn't really been living yoga. I had been, you know, a runner and I used yoga to keep my hamstrings stretched out and all of, you know, I felt good and I slept better. But once I really committed to the idea that, wow, this is, it it was the healthiest lifelong companion I had had at that point. I escaped a life 
of abuse and was given the opportunity to start my life over. And I thought, okay, you know, how can I do that? And the healthiest tool I had at the time that was my go-to was yoga. But by immersing myself in the idea that, wow, you know, I'm going to take this information I'm getting while I'm there and then somehow reflect either at the end of the day or in the morning, you know, what is this doing for me and what is my part in it? And I don't know about you, but I'm shocked to say that I had simply checked out of my life at the time and I wasn't the person, you know, driving the car. So I used the metaphor of uh, of the road because people will say yoga is a journey. And I used the metaphor to say, you know, I wasn't even driving the car of my life. I wasn't even like a passenger in the back seat. I had totally checked out and was letting other people um you know, design my life for me. So I think the the self-awareness, the accountability, which some people don't like, they, you know, it's easier to have somebody else or be a victim. And a lot of people are, you know, pretty stuck in um, sadness or anger or complacency or apathy or just sheer, you know, um, ho-hum. And I wasn't willing to do that anymore. I had gotten to a breaking point in my life where I thought, you know what? I have an opportunity to redesign my life. How am I going to do that? And it didn't take a lot of work. It was fun, but it was also so inspiring. And not only, you know, the other people that I was meeting, but as I came to really get to know myself, I found out I, I really enjoyed my company. I was okay with my flaws. I became really comfortable in my skin. I reclaimed my authentic voice and it was super powerful. So all those other things that I'm talking about, the emotional, the spiritual, the, the, um, the, the mental clarity that I got from this had nothing to do with the physical, but I needed the physical as the gateway to access all that information. Mm, very interesting. And I'm surprised actually that, you, that you've that you stuck with an Ashtanga style and you haven't moved more towards a yin. Um, the reason I say that is because my personal journey with yoga started when um, – I had a slight addiction to exercise and um, I really needed to put on some, some body fat and it, it was, wasn't so much that I wasn't eating enough but I just wasn't able to get enough fat compared to how much energy I was releasing. And right. so the doctor said, look, you've you got to take two years off exercise. Um, and I'm like grabbing at straws and I'm like, what about yoga? And he's like, yeah, yeah, you can do yoga. And I'm like, okay. So he obviously doesn't know that there's different types of yoga out there. So <laughs> exactly, of yeah. course I uh, started off with Bikram and thinking that oh, that wasn't right. that wasn't quite intense enough for me. So got into the Ashtanga yoga and, and did uh, this, the, the four series. Wow. Um, <laughs> I've never, I've never even made it past three. So I, that but there's a lot about your personality, which you know what is beautiful. And, but, and, and, and not so at the same time. So then I, um, I realized that obviously that wasn't what the doctor meant and right. had to uh, reassess. But funnily enough, um, but can you tell me, can I interrupt you by asking? Cause we're talking about this taking it off the mat. It didn't take the doctor though to say that it wasn't working. You figured it out by what? Well, co- common sense, I guess, but <laughs> again, I think you're you're diminishing the idea that this common sense is really what it's your intuition. Sure, that, sure. That, you know what I mean? That mm. I think you heightened the awareness to that common sense to go, huh? I'm still, you know, struggling with this. I like to call it. Uh, um, sensitivity to, you know, an addiction or a, a, a tendency, right? And I and I applaud you even sharing with people that you had this because other people are addicted to busyness or shopping or overworking or a lot of things. 
Mm. Yeah, so it was interesting my journey through through yoga and then getting to the point where my body decided that it was time for a double hip operation and forcing me then to get into the meditation, which, to be honest, out of all the different practices of yoga was definitely the most impactful on my life. Um, and then from there, when I could return back, it was more the yin style yoga that, that really I, I was drawn to potentially because that was what I knew I needed as opposed to what I wanted. Right. And, um, and so that's why I sort of turned that back to you. I, I can see your A type personality, your energized self and wondering whether, you've ever sort of felt that perhaps you need a, a slower sort of more? Absolutely. In fact, this is a really great question because I have been lucky enough to try a, a lot of different styles. So this is kind of the, the, the drop down menu on, on how I use yoga is that I almost use it as a medicine. So for instance, I, you know, for a while, during recovery from knee surgeries or hip surgeries, because I just wanted to be the old me. I was yearning for something that really wasn't there. I had to make peace with the new improved version of me, but still a different person, a different, you know, a different body to deal with. Yes, I've used a lot of different, much slower, much more meditative, healing uh, yoga styles, everything from even just a slow yoga. I mean, it was super humbling for me when I had to go and, and sit in a, a yoga chair class, but it was also kind of shocking. Uh, you know, it wasn't just for, you know, super old people. It was a lot of people who were either rehabilitating here in Coronado, where I live, the, is the Navy SEAL base. So there was a lot of military personnel who had come back from you know, war with with new uh, with new technology attached to them, moving sitting next to me. So it wasn't like it was uh, just people that were recovering from an illness or from a, a a problem. It was people that just really wanted to move and connect that movement to their breath because it enhanced everything else that they were probably doing anyway. But you're right. Like I tried yoga, hot yoga for a while because a friend loved Bikram and I did it with him. But the 26 pose sequence wasn't enough for me. I felt like a tennis player who was only swinging, you know, one way or a golf player going, when are we going to, you know, swing with the other arm? I was so used to the balance of making my um, uh, whole body practice with forward folds, backward folds, twists, um, moving from the standing down to the sitting, down to the meditative part, that it really didn't matter for me at that point what style I used. But yes, once I, you know, entered perimenopause and was having hot flashes, hot yoga was out. By then, I was so in tune with my body. I was like, you know what? This doesn't feel good. Don't do it. Try something else. And then I got into a really lighthearted practice. I would go even back to beginner classes on some days just to see, wow, you know what? I think I picked up some really bad habits if I talk to the teacher and say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm getting over a knee surgery. Can you watch me today? They'd come over and totally adjust me because I had become so hyper flexible. I was the bendy windy in class that that they, the teacher always pointed out and said, wow, look, you know, look at steps forward fold, but yet I had no strength. So I had become so out of balance by those super intense um, practices that I had been doing that the injuries actually were a gateway for me to try something else if that makes sense. 
Yeah, that's interesting that you mentioned the the hyper flexibility, and it's funny because I now run a, a gymnastics studio here in Manhattan, and we actually have a lot of yogis come in, and and obviously one of the biggest issues that they have is that they're they're too flexible without the mobility, and so always in my yoga classes I've I've t- taught that balance between strength and flexibility, and sort of concentrated on mobility, but I know depending on the yoga teacher and not all yoga really focuses on that mobility side of it. So yeah, it's interesting that that you've obviously. If if somebody like that is even aware, because I crave that super deep forward fold, but when teachers would say things like, or even when I was in teacher training and I would hear lift your kneecaps, I'm like, what, what is that? And in my mind, I thought I was doing it right when in reality I wasn't. That's why, once again, I I say, I don't care who you are, even as a teacher myself, I always stop and check in with the teacher and tell them where I'm at, what I want, just like a, a fitness trainer. You know, these are my goals. And not only are they accountable to help me get to my goals, I'm really engaged now in meeting that goal. So the cool thing for me is that those are ever changing every day. Every day, you know, people say sometimes at the beginning of class, oh, what's your intention for the day? Sometimes it's just to have fun. Sometimes it's just to, you know, tell myself once again that I can, you know, try and do that, you know, rock star pose that I'm not always doing so much now, you know, the the older I get. And there's a lot of things I've really made peace with. Like there's like you were talking about the four series, there's a million poses I'm never going to do. Doesn't matter. It's really the joy of just showing up, showing up for myself and, and committing to the idea that this lifestyle of wellness was something that I'm so grateful that, a, you know, pain and a bad back got me to adopt. Interesting. And, and, and Ali Fitness Podcast is all about bringing health into fitness. And this is, I guess, an interesting subject. You started talking about, you know, there's poses that you're aiming to do and, and people and teachers will will encourage you going, Oh, that's, that's an excellent pose. You're doing really well. Can you do this a bit better? And, and to what point do you feel that yoga has, um, or maybe you don't feel this, that it's become competitive in some in some realms. For example, I got into Bikram yoga and the reason I left it was because they wanted me to compete in a Bikram yoga competition. And that just wasn't to me what, what yoga was about. But in saying that, I've, I've actually met a teacher who did compete and she's actually famous now because she she did very well in that. But she's she's not like that at all in terms of she sees – the eight limbs of yoga to be her inspiration. But, but, but obviously she started at that point. So what do you yeah. think about that? Oh my God. I think a lot about all of what you said, because personally, especially traveling around the world, I am pretty old school. I, I like that it isn't about the goal, but yet what's wrong with having the goal um, as a very goal-oriented person myself, and um, a, a, a um, let's see, how can I say this? A competitive only with myself. For instance, like when I was a runner, I never was the fastest, but my goals were something as simple as when I did the mar- a marathon, I raised money for a nice, uh, you know, young man with leukemia. I just wanted to not, you know, be tragic running across the finish line. My goals were accomplished. And, you know, my the only marathon I've done, it was five and a half hours, but I ran. I never stopped. But yet at every band along the way, because it was one of the rock and roll marathons, I danced in the middle of the street. I, you know, I enjoyed myself. But yet there's other things like when I was doing half marathons before my hip surgery because I can no longer run. Man, once I, every year I got older and my time got faster, I started trying to improve my time. But that wasn't to try and prove anything to anybody else. It was simply from the joy of doing it. But I really believe I got that from yoga, not from running. Does that make sense? Mm. 
Yeah, so obviously you're not a big fan of of competing in yoga because to you it's about, I guess, achieving goals maybe that you set for yourself, but it's more about the practice and the journey. Well, I, I you know, it's funny because I – kind of am a middle way girl. I don't know if it's the Buddhist in me and I've really worked hard on non-judgment. So I, I'm not going to say never, but for me personally, it's not about the competition of the poses. Now, if that brings someone, like they've talked about whether or not to even have yoga in the Olympics. So how are you going to do that unless it's a competition? And I'm all for that because that would expose a lot of people to yoga and like everybody who we've shared earlier, everybody who shows up gets the other really yummy, magical things and the world could be a better place. I'm all for it. So if it has to start with a competitive spirit, I, I know in my heart, I haven't met a yet a person who may be super competitive, but yet you're also sleeping better, maybe a little kinder, maybe a little bit more self-aware of, of, of how you're moving through the world. But yet I know for me personally, yoga is so much more than the competitive part. I can be competitive and like right now, how many books or where, what, what numbers am I at on Amazon right now? So I can be really super, you know, self-critical or competitive or, uh, you know, assertive. But yet, because of yoga, I've learned that it's, wow, I'm, are you having a good time today, Steph? Are you enjoying your day? How's your, you know, how's, how's every aspect of your life, not just the, okay, I got to get to the finish line and get a better time. Yeah. And I can see your journey and, and where it's taken you. And this book is a great, a great read and a, a great way for people to see how you can find yourself. And I love in the book, you said, and I quote, by the time I finished the book, I knew that my Dharma, my sole purpose was to educate and inspire as many people as I could to try yoga and embrace it as a way of life. How and when did you actually realize that that was your Dharma, your, your, your life purpose? That's really, really, I mean, I have chills just hearing you read that. Because I think before that, I just was like a lot of people like, why am I here? Well, you know, what, what, what's this all really about? So to really now know why I'm on the planet besides, you know, I, I'm very, very lucky. I experienced the joy of bringing two lives into the world, which is pretty amazing in itself. Other than that, now that I know why I'm here, wow. Does that feel mind blowing good? Because I before didn't have the, uh, wow, I was just so insecure at the time too. When I, when I first went on this yoga road trip, it's, it just is so comforting and so powerful to now really feel like I could help and you know, uh, everything I, I do now with this Dharma, um, understanding is really about helping someone else and giving back. And I used to read about that in books and it sounds really great and anybody can help other people, but yet I didn't know how now to know how is really amazing and just really lovely and just gives me a lot of peace. And Stephanie, when did that click with you that that was your dharma? Was there a moment or was it? It was literally on the road. I had, you know, rented an RV and 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 embarked on this journey back before glamping was even a term or anybody thought it was cute on Instagram. And I just was so happy. It was a kind of elation that I hadn't experienced from either an interpersonal relationship or a, um, a life experience. I was so full of joy of figuring out, wow, if I could just share what I'm experiencing with other people, I know I'm going to change somebody's life. And to understand that and embody that is the greatest gift I've ever been given. And I gave it to myself. That's awesome. 
Look, um, I'm going to link to your yoga wisdom book on 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 in our show notes, and, and of course, everything else, your blog and your your website. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with our listeners, um, whether it be about yoga, on the mat, off the mat, anything at all? Well, first off, I just want to say thank you so much for having me. The 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 more people that I can just encourage to either pick up the book or buy one for a friend who may be interested, or more than that, for anyone who's struggling. I know personally, I was hiding the fact that I was in a lot of pain. And I think we have epidemics now um, of either loneliness or people who are afraid to say that they're struggling. And in our technology-driven world, I believe I'm connecting more now with people but I'm hearing more and more people say they're feeling more isolated or they're feeling more disconnected from others. And I know that if you walk into a yoga studio, there's other people there that are kind and compassionate and caring because I found that for myself and I now get to give that to others. But yoga for me is the tool. And I think yoga is for everybody. Anybody can do it. But if it isn't yoga, if it might be something else, you're still going to get a lot of wisdom in this book that really is more about life than it is about yoga. So that's why it's easy for me to be excited about it, because it's not just my voice. All of the people that I've gathered are here to show you how to live a life beyond your wildest dreams. I love it. And funny, I uh, I often hear that the biggest comment as to or why someone doesn't want to do yoga is because they tell me they're not flexible enough. And I feel like the only real excuse should be I'm too enlightened, so I don't need yoga. <laughs> because if I say to you I'm not flexible enough, that's like saying I'm I'm too fat to go on a diet. Exactly. Um, so I, I thought you'd agree with me there. But look, Stephanie, I, I really appreciate you coming on the show. And look, before I let you go, there's one question that we always ask our guests on the show. And that is, do you have a tattoo? No, I don't. In fact, it's funny because every once in a while, I take a marker and scribble a, a Sanskrit symbol on my foot so I can see it in forward fold. It's a symbol for freedom And if I got a tattoo, that would probably be the one. But I am one of those people that like new experiences. So I assume if I got a tattoo, I'd grow tired of it because I'm ever changing and growing like I think everyone is. So whatever that message is that I'm trying to say to the world, I think there's going to be a different new message next week. And I, I, I have so many friends that say, well, I didn't do the tattoo for someone else. I just did it for myself. And I think I just believe that whatever the tattoo would be, I'd grow tired of it because I think I'm, God, I'm, you know, I've had many lifetimes and, and many different personalities and many different expressions of what I want to say. So I can't get locked into one. Yeah, I think you'd probably grow tired of it because you do so many forward folds that you'd be looking at your foot too often. <laughs> Probably. You're so right. Look, Stephanie, thanks again for coming on and we'll share everything in the show notes. Thank you so much for having me. It was a a huge honor. For all the resources and show notes from today's episode, please go to www.ally.fitness. If you like today's episode, please show your appreciation by going to iTunes, give us a five-star review and subscribe. Subscribe.